Every single day, our public trust is being undermined by the pollution that these pens are putting into our sound. Humans have always thought themselves as superior to nature. It's got us into a lot of trouble. Scavenger on one, what is your emergency? My husband and I are on our boat in Secret Harbor and the middle fish pen is breaking apart. It's huge. And the whole thing is buckling. There's a fork look, that looks like it's about ready to go in the water. It's pretty Real dramatic time. to me. Well, what just happened was that there was a catastrophic failure. One of the net pens off of Cypress Island completely imploded. The fish that escaped are Atlantic salmon. They're not Pacific salmon. We're talking 305,000 exotic species are now polluting Puget Sound. These fish are gonna be entering into our rivers, competing with our wild fish in the spawning grounds, competing with them for food, bringing diseases and parasites and viruses to these wild fish, and it's, it, it's a disaster. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we're super excited about what's going on and we're happy you could be here. Um, that was a clip from the film Artificial, it's a Patagonia film, uh, to kind of help us set the table of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm Dylan Tomina, I'm a Patagonia fly fishing ambassador and writer. And uh, you'll notice that nowhere in that title does it say uh, talk show host or moderator. So uh, <laughs> I'm not exactly a professional. I'm just going to try and wing it here and do the best we can. So I have some notes and we're going to try and uh, make this uh, as good as possible. Um, so what we're going to try and do here is we have this action where everybody can participate in some activism. And um, the goal is to keep what you saw in that film from ever happening again. And more than that, um, these net pens are all around the world and they have daily problems as well with tons of, of pollution, fecal pollution, um, uh, pesticides, chemicals that all flow freely out into the public waters. Um, so we'd like to stop that as well. And uh, your being here tonight and participating can make that possible. So uh, I want to start with some introductions. We have uh, Ben Gibbard, our friend, uh, who's a lifelong Puget Sound resident. He's the singer and songwriter for Death Cab for Cutie. Um, and as a big fan myself, I'm super stoked that he's here and, and uh, he's going to play some songs for us. He's, uh, um, he's the spoonful of sugar to help the uh, conservation medicine go down. <laughs> um, we also have Birgit Cameron. She's the global director of Patagonia Provisions, and um, she's going to talk a little bit about how, uh, why Patagonia Provisions is uh, a partner in this uh, in this activism we're doing here today. Uh, and then Kurt Beardsley, the Executive Director of Wild Fish Conservancy, uh, is the uh, the evil genius behind what is a, a pretty um, <laughs> a subversive way. Uh, this is actually I, I can't wait to get into this a little more because it's one of the more exciting conservation actions that. Uh, that I've ever been a part of. And so I think you guys are gonna be excited to be a part of it as well. Um, so Kurt, let's just start with you and everybody can kind of jump in where it fits, but um, what's this all about? What, what's going on here? Well, uh, a big part of what it's all about is what you just saw. You just saw um, this giant collapse at Cypress Island. And that was a real wake up call for everybody in Puget Sound to say, enough is enough. This industry is far too dangerous, pollutes too much. It risks our salmon and killer whales and the health of Puget Sound, and we need to get rid of it. And within a year, they passed legislation to ban Atlantic salmon net pens in Puget Sound. The industry saw a loophole in this and said, well, hey, we won't plant Atlantic salmon will plant another species and they decided to plant steelhead. The, uh, the issue that we're talking about right now is that um, Cook is ready to reapply 
for new leases. And these leases last from 10 to 15 years. And it's the timeline is going to be too quick to try to get new legislation to ban them from raising any fish, in, which was the intent of the public. And so uh, we're trying a novel approach and we're trying to lease the exact same lands that Cook has been leasing and, and other industries have been leasing for the last 30 years. And it's, um, there's only a few places right now that is allowed to have pens. And if, if we apply, which we did, and if DNR agrees to give us the leases instead of Cook, they have basically been um, removed from options to have net pens in Puget Sound. And then those lands then would be held in trust for the use and enjoyment of the public and um, also our, 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 to fulfill our treaty obligations, uh, which is something that has been definitely affected by these pens. And then on top of all that, it is to restore these habitats and the health of these habitats to their historical condition. Um, it's, a, it's a great, it's a, we've never tried anything like this. I have never seen anything like this on the entire coast. And we have lots of, we have lots of friends um, around the world that are watching to see if this works because it may end up helping others do the same thing. Anyway. Okay. So, so the, the Reader's Digest version of this is we are trying to lease the industrial net pen sites that Cook Aquaculture currently holds. And then we're gonna evict Cook Aquaculture and restore these public waters for the benefit of everyone. Much better said, yes, yeah, exactly. Right? That's, the bottom, that's the bottom line. Okay. Yeah. All right, so that, that's where the, uh, the, the subversive side of it comes in is that we're actually gonna try and apply for these leases the way any other uh, uh, corporation would, except we're gonna try and uh, control them for the benefit rather than the detriment of, of the people and the critters that live in Puget Sound. Um, ben, I want to come back to you here a little bit that um, you grew up in Puget Sound. Like this is your home stomping ground. Um, I think Bremerton, right? Yeah, I grew up in, uh, in Bremerton, kind of on the right on the cusp of Silverdale and Bremerton, kind of in that area. Can you talk a little bit about why this is something that, uh, that you wanted to be a part of or kind of what your connection to the Puget Sound is? Right. Well, you know, the, the initial... Uh, event was incredibly uh, disturbing to me as a as a resident of the Northwest and as someone who loves the Salish Sea, and you know I grew up, uh, you know when we when we were when I was growing up, virtually every Thanksgiving, uh, my my parents would walk my sister and I down to Barker Creek, which was a uh, small creek, kind of down about a mile, mile and a half away, uh, to watch the, you know the salmon making their way up the creek to spawn. And, you know, at when I was a, a, a child and seeing this was just incredibly moving and beautiful and mysterious. And uh, to my knowledge, we're still, we still don't exactly know why or how they're able to accomplish this. And to me, it's one of the great mysteries of, of uh, the natural world in general and, and certainly the ocean. Um, and it's something that made an impression on me at a really young age. So I, I felt when I was approached about uh, this, I, I wanted to be an ally in this fight because I think it's incredibly important. Sweet, well, I, we're, we're really excited to have you. And while we have you on that note, um, can you play us a song? I think there's yeah. a whole bunch of people tuned in mostly to hear you play, <laughs> uh, including Absolutely. yourself. So, uh. <laughs> well, this is, this, I think this is what, uh, this is what uh, KRS-One from Boogie Down Productions might call edutainment. This is both at the same time. So mm. uh, I'm gonna play a song called Proxima B. Oh, this world's starting to bring me down The ocean's rising and we're all gonna drown There's a place where you and I can go We can 
start this whole mess all over Proxima B Bathed in the glow of Centauri Proxima B Careless and free Try to tell me that there's no second act Say your goodbyes and get your suitcase packed So what's the point of trying to save this place? If there's another out and outer space Proxima B From where its sun isn't guaranteed Proxima B The stars are a sea Proxima B Bathed in the glow of Centauri Proxima B Careless and free We won't make the same mistakes twice But everybody's starting to figure it out Our little planet's slowly crying and crying Proxima B I remember when it was just you and me On Proxima B Careless and free On Proxima B From where its sun isn't guaranteed On Proxima B The stars are a sea I chose this song. Uh, it's a, a, a wow. piece of uh, satire. Hopefully, that you guys picked that up. But <laughs> I remember um, a handful of years ago there was a, a discovery of a planet deep out in the solar system called Proxima B that they thought might have uh, might be habitable for human life, and you know so became so started all the articles about um, oh well, we have this place we can go if we kind of ruin this place, um, <laughs> yeah. and. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I wrote this particular song as kind of a piece of satire in the sense that, uh, you know, when we kind of dream about places we can go once we've already ruined this place, we're already, we're already, we already have the wrong mindset. We need to, we need to kind of protect what we have here. And uh, it's, it's not too late. Um, and uh, so that we need to kind of stop dreaming about places we can escape to if this planet is... <laughs> Uh, uh, made unhabitable by our poor choices as a human race. Wow, that's that was awesome. Thank you. That, that was a great, <laughs> yeah. fun, great choice. Thanks, Ben. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Brigitte, that that's a pretty tough act to follow. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> uh, uh, but I wanted to start this section with you, Brigitte, about um, you know why is this the net pen issue and and being able to kick them out of the Salish Sea, why is that important to Patagonia provision? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um, yeah, thanks for that amazing song, Ben. Um, well, really, you know, I built Patagonia provisions with our founder, Yvonne Chouinard from, you know, our core mission statement, which is really that we are in business to save our home planet. So, so everything we make at Provisions has this very deep reason for being. 
and a new way of looking at supply chains um, for food. And so well, our first product was um, wild salmon because we wanted to show how we can change the paradigm on how salmon can be sourced and harvested. And so we can show that wild salmon can be abundant in our future, which is actually true, right? If we let wild be wild, they will come back in abundance. This is a fact. So we built, um, we also built a criteria with Wild Fish Conservancy, Kurt and, and others, um, a part of our scientific advisory that has been peer reviewed and published so that we can help raise the bar on harvesting techniques. What, what, what is right? What is the right path forward? What, what is acceptable? Um, and so part of that is no hatchery and no net pens. Um, these are part of the core tenets of this criteria because of the devastation that it causes, which you've, you've seen, and Kirk can talk a little bit more about that as well today. Um, we currently source now from um, Lummi Island reef nets that are local to the Salish Sea and, 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 uh, uh, and also from Alaska. And, and when we discovered that one of our processors in Alaska was invested in the Puget Sound net pens, we couldn't stay away. We needed to take action by removing our business from them and highlighting you know, a better path forward by producing this moment with you all and sharing the facts and science that we know about this issue so that we can all collectively together take back the sound. We can't do this alone. This is actually a, a collective action and, and, and a moment um, that, that is super important if we, if we wanna change the paradigm. So really, um, we know there is a better path um, that takes into consideration ocean restoration and methods that allow our salmon to rebound naturally. And, um, you know, that's sort of why we do what we do here. And, and we, we, we felt that this was um, one of the most important times to just, you know, make sure that we, we, we come together in this uh, and, and let, me, let people know about it. So one of the, uh, the sort of founding uh, reasons for existence of provisions was actually to protect wild salmon. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, if you protect wild salmon, um, you know, that kit, like I said earlier, that can come back in abundance, um, then we can have wild salmon in the future. Then, you know, uh, my kids, your kids, the future generations can experience what it's like to have wild salmon. We really need to take these, these polluting um, ways of, of harvesting um, and growing fish out of the waterways. They just don't have any business being there um, and go back to what nature really intended, which is if we just let that alone um, and, and, you know, as the native communities um, have done for eons, you know, uh, we will have the future um, abundance we need uh, for food supply. And, and it's as simple as that, just because we can do so many things um, with, with how we grow our food and how we harvest and all of that kind of thing doesn't mean we necessarily should. We need to take a hard look at what actually works, what helps us restore and regenerate, and, and, and what we can put in that basket for the future, for, for ways in which we need to uh, produce food. And, and, you know, like I said, this is one of these moments in time to take a look at the devastation that happens when something like this happens and say, all right, we know another way is possible. So let's really emphasize that and, and let's talk about it and educate it around, uh, around it so that, you know, we can all, you know, have a piece in, in, in making a difference with this. It's the right thing to do. So we, we, like I said, we could not stay away. And um, so here we are. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not counting on there being wild salmon on Proxima B, Ben. So uh, <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> uh, we got to do what we can. I mean, that's such, that's such a smart message. I, I love the tone of that. Um, okay, we're gonna go to uh, another clip from Artificial that shows another aspect of these in industrial net pens. So. Um, if we can cue that up, we'll, as uh, Brian Williams says, we'll talk about it on the other side. I really always wanted to see, see one of these farms. We got into our wetsuits. 
Then we jumped into the sea and we sneaked up to one of these farms. I knew I, I was going to see a lot of fish, but I didn't think it was going to be that bad. It was so full of sick fish. They had fungus, they looked like S's. They were wounds big as my hand. Nobody should eat this. You show this to the moms, they wanna feed their kids with this. They will never buy one of these fish. It was like if you should walk into a farm where you have cows that would have big wounds bleeding and lying down, barely breathing. Who would eat that? No one. But these things are happening under the surface, you know? Nobody knows about this. Okay, um, does that whet everybody's <laughs> appetite to eat some net pen farm salmon? <laughs> um, that was uh, that was actually my friend Michael Prodeen, uh, and it was shot in Norway. Um, but in that film, we were trying to show kind of the global perspective, and and the issues with net pens exist all around the country. These are multinational corporations that are running them. Um, they're all throughout Scandinavia. They're growing in Iceland. They're in the UK, the eastern coast of Canada, the entire coast of British Columbia. Um, uh, they're fish farms in uh, throughout Asia and Australia. So it is a global issue, but we're going to start here by kicking them out of Puget Sound. That, that's the starting point. And then hopefully we can make this uh, a model of how to do it in other places as well. Um, so one of the things I think that you saw in that clip is uh, the result of, of, of feedlots. And that's what these are, as, as Froden says in that, that clip, that we're growing them underwater so people can't see it. But it's essentially the same as a, as a cattle feedlot. And when you have huge amounts of animals compressed into really small areas for efficiency's sake, um, there's problems with disease and parasites, which these salmon have, as you can see, um, in spades. And um, in order to control those disease and parasites, there are vast amounts of antibiotics and other pharmaceuticals, chemical pesticides, and net pens are exactly what the name implies. They're nets. And so all of that is flowing out and affecting um, the wild salmon that are passing by on their migration route. So um, in light of all that, I just, I wanted to open this up to the panel a little bit and just maybe we'll start with you, Kurt, like, uh, you know, if, if you have any thoughts after looking at that clip or, or how that affects what we're doing. I mean, I think Michael made a great point, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, this stuff, what, what uh, Michael was seeing and was showing you, that's happening everywhere. I mean, absolutely everywhere in the world, this is, um, it's a problem. It's it's a problem. It's a different problem everywhere. But to bring it home a little bit, um, when we had the Cypress Island uh, collapse in 2017, was the first time we were able to actually get our hands on some of these fish. You can't even buy these fish from the pens itself to sample them to see if they are carrying viruses or parasites. Well, we just happened to get our hands on a lot of them when after the collapse, roughly 50,000 pounds of them uh, were available because of the, the tribes had caught them and commercial fishermen caught them. And for the first time, we were able to send in tissue samples to have them analyzed for viruses, for example. And we, we sent it to uh, Dr. Kabenge, who is one of two world reference labs um, I mean, he is an absolute expert on viruses. He ended up sequencing uh, the, we found a virus, which was Picine real virus. And then he sequenced the virus to find out where that virus came from. And the virus showed, or the sequencing showed that it originally came from Norway. And then it went to Iceland. And Iceland is exactly where Cook gets their eggs from. So, having a pen in Puget Sound allowed for this industry 
to bring in an exotic virus that's deadly to wild salmon that has never been seen before on the entire coast and was never captured by our agencies. Out of sight, out of mind, um, a little different issue, but extremely dangerous issue. Um, importing viruses, they're, they're here forever. <laughs> It's very hard to get rid of a virus once it's in the wild. And native fish, such as Atlantic salmon, which, which is what they were importing, when a, when a species evolves with a virus, it is much less susceptible to being harmed by it because there are certain immunities that it has adapted. But when you have a, a non-native host, like our wild Pacific salmon, the risks are phenomenal. Um, same sort of thing when Europeans came here and what happens when, when, when they brought diseases and viruses um, uh, from England, for example, uh, what happened to First Nations and tribes in the Pacific Northwest was devastating because they had never been exposed to them. Same sorts of things. Um, it's a dirty industry, and what I described is just one part of the kinds of damage that, you, that they can do, and we've got to get these out of our waters. And we can have, if you want to have farm-raised fish, don't have them in public waters. Put these facilities onto land where they will recycle their water, if they have a disease problem, it's their problem. If they have a parasitic problem, it's their problem. Where nothing goes back into public waters, nothing goes back to harm our wild salmon, our killer whales, the health of our entire ecosystem. That's the solution. It's, it's the only industry that doesn't really have to deal with it, the problems it brings about. So part so, of the yeah. So, so part of the problem there also, I mean, I think we should look at this sort of from an economic standpoint in that um, one of the reasons why net pen salmon farms are so profitable is because their waste disposal is on us, the public, right? That <laughs> yeah. going the public water. So we're basically subsidizing the industry because they don't have to pay to deal with any of their waste issues or disease issues. Um, a, a good point on that, just, just to get to the, uh, the waste. I mean, just for um, nitrogen alone, the waste that the net pens in Puget Sound puts out is equivalent to the cities of Bellingham, Everett, Port Angeles, and Togo Tacoma combined. Yeah. All of those cities, wow. all of those cities, the, the nitrogen that they put out. Um, I mean, it's, and, and there's, and those cities are all processing their, their waste. The Atlantic salmon net pens or, or if, if they ever get allowed, the steelhead net pens would be producing the same amount. They just, they're just discharging straight into Puget Sound, no processing. It's basically having a feedlot, like a cattle feedlot, suspended over our waters, discharging it right in there. It's just, it's insane. And they're one of the only industries, I'm, or the only industry I'm aware of, that has that, <laughs> that's allowed under the law to do that. And we've got to get this, we've got to get this dirty industry out of our waters and okay, work well, on restoring our waters. So yeah, I, and I, sorry. Oh, I was okay. just, I'm going to get to Birgit here because I, I think. Um, I got a thought brew in there, Dylan. Yeah, no, I, I think that. Um, <laughs> Go, <you> know, Birgit. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, there's there's going to be a time lag before these sort of closed containment dry land salmon farms are really available to the general public at an affordable cost. I think it's going to happen, but it's going to take some time. And there's really not a lot of incentive right now because they can put them in the water and we pay for basically all the problems that develop. So, Birgit, what I wanted, I hope this is what where you are going. What I'd love to have your reaction to a little bit is, in the meantime, uh, until there are sort of clean farm salmon available, um, what do you recommend to somebody that, that loves to eat salmon? Yeah, I, well, I think before I dive into that little, little that, that piece as well, I just want to acknowledge what, what Kurt and, and others are, are saying about, you know, we can't see all of this waste, right? Because it's below the surface of the water. So the ecosystem that is 
is below the surface of the water is being pummeled by all of this bad stuff. If we could yeah. see that on the surface, if we could see that in the air, there is no way we would allow that to happen, right? So, so this is why this is so important and these underwater um, images are incredible and to see what those fish look like is, is super important, right? Um, we have to think of our, our planet as our host and that what everything we do has, um, you know, some sort of ripple effect. So, what are the actions um, that we're taking, you know, causing? And this, this is this is sort of this change in our mindset around that, right? It's it's um, we're destroying the very, you know, system that supports us as human beings. And I and and so so great. So now we know this. So now we're going to do something about it. And it also turns out that doing the right thing produces better and more delicious food, right? So we're not giving anything up. We're actually moving toward, you know, saying, hey, you know, by the way, we're screwing up our, our, our system here, but, you know, we're also messing up how our food tastes. What, what flavor? If you've seen a farmed salmon before, most of it is just sort of like, instead of that beautiful, rich, uh, orangey color, it's this sort of flat, you know, uh, fleshy looking thing. And, and those are all indicators of, of, of flavor and health. And, and so wild salmon actually just tastes better. So we're not giving anything up, like I said. In fact, it's a delicious act to take a stand on all of this, right? It's better for the planet, better for our Absolutely. health, yep. right? So why not take charge of that? And, and, and I think that's a really Im important thing, right? So what people can do about that, um, you know, I think it's, it's number one, sign this petition today. <laughs> so let's get these guys out, right? Um, so, you know, let's just be clear. And, and then, uh, but the other is just along the way, right? Because you, you start to know this information and you're like, oh my God, what the hell do I do when I'm in the grocery store now? And I think the simplest thing you can do is really look for wild salmon, not wild caught. Wild caught actually means hatchery and it means that there's some genetic uh, difference um, or that it's, you know, done in a way where it's like released just like a chicken, right? A chicken, the cage free, you have to look at that too, right? There's, there's different degrees of it. So anyway, wild is what you want to look at and kind of really look into the source, understand what is behind the scenes. And I think that's something that people are starting to shop their values a little bit more and they're starting to look at, um, you know, what is behind making their foods? What does the supply chain start to look like um, for the things that you're feeding yourself and your family and people that you love? Um, you know, these are all uh, just decisions we can start making and there's great power in that, right? It's a little act that can go a long way in supporting better paths forward. Okay. So, so I'm going to summarize that just really briefly here. If people, <laughs> are looking, if people are looking for like the the simple rules of thumb, you know, I would start with yes, sign the petition. Um, but there's still vast amounts of of farm salmon that are coming into the market from from Chile, from Norway, from all over the place. So, um, in summary, I think I would say. Um, uh, don't buy or order farmed salmon right now because there's a greatest chance that it came from an open water net pen. Um, so don't order farmed salmon um, and look for responsibly harvested wild salmon. There's a lot of press around uh, wild fish being uh, in trouble all over the place. Uh, Birgit mentioned earlier the, the, um, the wild salmon sourcing uh, board that the Patagonia Provisions convened. And so there's been a ton of research into finding places where there are wild runs of salmon that can sustain really responsible harvest. And um, those are, I'm not necessarily making this an ad for Patagonia provisions. It, you can find these in other places <laughs> as well. Um, but that is um, don't buy or order farm salmon and look for responsibly harvested wild salmon on the menu or talk to your fish person at the grocery store. Um, I also, a couple other points of clarity. Uh, when, uh, when Kurt's talking about uh, Cook, uh, I believe we're talking about Cook Aquaculture, which is a multinational yes. corporate yeah. entity that happens to own all the, uh, the open water net pen salmon farms in Puget Sound, right? It's a billion dollar corporation, you literally, as you say, around the world. Okay. All right. Well, cool. Um, so um, that was a pretty heavy, <laughs> that was a pretty heavy... Uh, <laughs> 
heavy discussion. Now that we've basically ensured that nobody's going to want to order or eat any of those deformed fish, um, on that note, I think I can use the, uh, the spoonful of sugar here, which is a, a call out to Ben for some help there. Um, can you play us another song? We need yeah, a Ben give, break. Yeah. I'll give you something a little more, uh, I'll give you something a little sweeter and less satirical. Uh, this is a song uh, I, I contributed to a, a, a remake of the movie Arthur a number of years ago, and I always like to kind of pull it out uh, at occasions like this, which, uh, i.e., uh, shows where I'm not, uh, you know, like solo kind of stuff. So here we go. Oh, and this song is called When the Sun Goes Down on Your Street. The sun goes down, down on your street Oh, let me be the one you meet In the lamplight hum of a night that's just begun and Though you fear where shadows fall There's nothing there to harm you at all Uncover your eyes, presume uncertain sky and rise, rise, step into the night, it'll be all right. When the sun goes down, down on your street, and you're feeling strangely incomplete, Oh, please don't grieve for days that fell like leaves. Cause under a moon that hangs from silver strings, we know not what this darkness brings. But the stars all gleam with possibility. So arise. Right, step into the night, but it'll be all right. When the sun goes down, down on your street, oh, let me be the one you meet, for I've waited years for you to return. Rise, arise, step into the night. Yes, arise, arise, step into the night. Arise, arise, step into the night. It'll be all. Yeah. Wow. That was beautiful. Wow. I love Thank that. You. And Thank you. we all need hope, right? <laughs> I mean, and there is hope. I think that's just, that's a really great song. Yeah, thank you very moment. much. Thanks. I'm beautiful. glad you guys enjoyed it. A um, couple of things on that. One is um, uh, we're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulty with the quality of the video coming out of, of uh, Ben's house. And I want to say that rather than complain about it, uh, we think that this is because of the large number of kids being educated on the internet right now. And so <laughs> we're going to take that as a good sign that 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 uh, rather than complain, we're supporting the education of uh, hundreds of kids in Ben's neighborhood. So, um, so that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to mention right at this point is that uh, when the pandemic first hit and and everybody was pretty scared and locked down and and you know maybe not that we're not now but but when it was new and it was really scary um, Ben did a series of of uh, of YouTube was it on YouTube Ben uh, yeah it was kind of broadcast over a number of different platforms yeah and I yeah. I happened to be a friend of mine said hey you got to check this out. And um, they were just very quiet uh, moments of Ben playing guitar and kind of giving back to the greater community. And um, if you guys can find them online and you're into Ben's music, they're really beautiful examples of, I think, how art can kind of uplift us all and help us get through tough times. And 
Um, so I wanted to just say thanks, Ben, because those were uh, those were really helpful to my family. And um, um, just like you're helping us out here today, it's uh, it's really an awesome thing. So thank you. Well, it's nice to hear that. And you know, I think it's also worth mentioning that they're really helpful to me as well. I mean, getting a chance to kind of have community, uh, you know, musical community at a time when, uh, you know, I, I and the, our band wasn't able to play shows or play in front of audiences. Um, it was nice to kind of inject something that felt at least related to normalcy uh, into my kind of daily routine. That was just playing music for people. So uh, it was incredibly helpful for me as well as uh, hopefully people who were able to tune in. Yeah, thank you so much. We also, also, if you're out there just cruising around the internet, the uh, I love the NPR Tiny Desk concert you guys did. That that's a yeah yeah that's a really oh, good one. You. That's uh, that's thank super you. fun. So, um, okay, we're gonna keep this uh, trying to keep it moving along here. Um, we're gonna go to one more clip and uh, and we'll talk about it after. The southern resident killer whale population that I've been studying for 42 years began a serious decline around 1995. It was almost 100 whales. We're down to 74 right now. Salmon and orcas are just predator prey. They're like that. If you have a decline in the food, you have a decline in the whales. So. Uh, southern resident killer whales. Uh, I got a brief update on that. Uh, one is that uh, uh, there were two calves born to this, our local killer whales that live in Puget Sound here. Um, there were two uh, calves born last month. Um, one of them was to the mother who was famous uh, about two years ago, um, who gave birth to a calf that died shortly after it was born and she pushed it along and carried it on this thousand mile kind of journey of grief. And uh, a lot of us kind of watched that. And she, that is one of the mothers that has given birth again. So we're really thankful for that. Um, and I wanted to tell just a quick story that uh, around the same time that I was talking about um, with Ben's uh, uh, video concerts, uh, I, we had just locked down. My family um, was, was I think, pretty nervous and we were worried and felt lonely and isolated. And um, we had gone down to the beach and even that we weren't sure if it was okay to be on the beach or not. And we were standing there, this was, it was cold out and um, kind of just looking out at the water and trying to find some peace and something to sustain us. And, and uh, a pod of these Southern resident killer whales came right up the beach and swam you know, just offshore in front of us. And we, we could hear them breathing before we could see them. That deep breathing you just heard in that clip. And um, a woman who was socially distanced, but standing down the beach from us, um, turned around and as the whales were right in front of us, she had tears in her eyes and she looked up at the sky and said, this is exactly what we needed. Um, and I think about that moment in relation to uh, our relationship to these whales that are kind of like our local um, iconic species and uh, feel like it's more important than ever that we do what we can to protect them. Um, so I wanted to open this up too. What, you know, how are the whales connected to all this with the net pens? Well, I guess I can address some of that. I mean, the, the killer whales, the Southern resident killer whales are by many scientists uh, opinions, starving to death. They have many problems, but one of the big problems they're seeing is that they don't have enough food. They don't have the right kind of food, which is large, wild Chinook. And anything that um, reduces or harms the habitats of Puget Sound Chinook will harm um, killer whales. And definitely by compromising the quality of the habitat in Puget Sound um, will do that. And net pens are right in there, bringing in exotic viruses and, and parasites and tons of pollution. All of that is a major uh, compromise for the health of Puget Sound. And we can't continue to go down that road 
NetPens have been doing that in Puget Sound for 30 years. We have a chance to turn that around. And that, that will be a great help um, to restoring our sound, to restoring our commitment to getting rid of the worst players. And um, we, have, we have a chance, and this is it. And we're going to go back to signing the petition. But if you want to help out, if you want to help wild salmon, if you want to help our killer whales, if you want to help the, the health of Puget Sound that has actually sustained life for thousands of years, I mean, um, for our, our tribal communities, um, well, we need to get rid of the big problems and we have a solution and we need to pick them off when we can. And uh, as Ben said in the song before last, you know, we have a chance to get it right. And um, I hope you all help us. Anybody else have just thoughts about the existence of these whales, like in our local waters or, or how important they might be? Well, I can yes. just speak. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, um, Ben. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I can just speak to growing up here in the Northwest and uh, my both my sister and her partner and my dad are, are, are sailors and uh, spend a lot of time out in Sailor Sea. Uh, you know, the moments that you come with an eye shot of, of you, know, you know, these animals it just changes your life. I mean, they're just the most majestic things that you've ever seen. And I think that as Americans, we are, we have become sadly less and less accustomed to seeing, uh, you know, the majesty of nature uh, in, in, uh, in their actual habitats. Uh, you know, we go to aquariums, we go to zoos, and we feel that we have some kind of interaction with uh, these animals. And, and to, to kind of actually be able to bear witness to these animals, uh, you know, in, in their natural habitat is, is a life-changing life experience. I mean, people come to the Northwest, tourists come here for the sole purpose of seeing these animals. And the opportunities that we've had to kind of interact with them, you know, from afar, I wouldn't say, maybe interact is not the right word. I don't think <laughs> I want yeah. that. Uh, but to have an experience uh, in the presence of these animals of just, you know, being in awe of them is, 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 a, is phenomenal and something that, you know, is very much a part of living in the Northwest and, and visiting the Northwest. Well said. Yeah, I, I, I would, I mean, I think that's really right that, there's nothing like being in it and seeing it and, and you know at this moment of time it's in time it's not that easy to to get to it but if you do in the future um, I would recommend going um, I remember being there with my kids and and on the reef nets and and just taking in what that was all about and and what a miracle it is that we have this beautiful ecosystem that will produce for us and if we take care of it and and you know just what that was like to to just be there in that in that environment and and so absolutely go there um if you can or even just you know read about it and 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 watch films and things that can show you what that's like um but i think it <clears throat> it also prompts the idea that you know we need to think about like all of us sort of in our businesses, in creating new businesses and things like that as well, in our choices we make in, in you know, just from going to the grocery store or as we start to think about what does the future of business look like and how can business partake in helping restore our ecosystems, that we start to frame things in a way for ourselves from a solution-based mindset, right? Build businesses um, influence other businesses. You know, we would love if Cook and all these other fishing industry businesses would would really take into account all this information now, the science that's available to us, and start to pivot their businesses toward uh, you know these good things because. You know, you you can make money by doing good. We've proven that out with Patagonia, and and I think that you know that's what we want people to start to to think about to reframe our actions from uh, you know with this sort of solution based mindset with with knowledge that we have right now, which is amazing and and so substantiated around what we can do. You know, what how do we how do we build? 
um, new things for the future? How do we take actions, small and large, uh, that, that take all of that into consideration? Um, it's, it's actually a really hopeful and exciting time, thinking about, thinking about it as uh, a moment for innovation, uh, a moment for, for you know, newness and, and, and hope and, and something that will, will benefit all of us in our future generations. So we, we have talked um, about kind of the problems. We've, we've started out with, you know, the issues around the net pen salmon farms and, and the ones owned by Cook Aquaculture in particular. And we have kind of narrowed down along the way around what we can do about them, um, how they affect the other creatures and the humans that live here. Um, I want to just t start this with Kurt uh, briefly here. Um, to explain what exactly, what are the mechanisms? How does signing this petition actually work in in kind of our uh, our punk rock approach to activism yeah. here? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about like if I'm signing that petition, what what is that actually doing? Well, it can do it can do a number of things. Um, again, we're going to be in competition with a, a billion dollar corporation they want to lease the exact same lands and we're both going to be applying. We've already submitted our applications to DNR and DNR um, needs to make a decision and they need to end up weighing, which they, they never really have had this before. They've never had a competing um, bid for the exact same locations. Um, one thing we can do is if, if people support our petition, to end up uh, bringing this, you know, restoring these lands and bringing them back, uh, um, having a trust that holds them, you know, for the benefit of, of the public and of restoring, you know, treaty rights. Um, that makes, that gives DNR an option that they wouldn't have before. They could potentially be sued by Cook if, if they're not willing to lease it at all. Uh, it, it's a long shot, but they absolutely could be, and they're very powerful. They're, they have lots of money. So in a way, you can protect DNR um, by allowing them to make a choice instead of saying, no, we just don't want to lease it at all. We're going to lease it to um, this use of restoring Puget Sound. And what's in our favor is that DNR has to look at uh, the criteria of what makes, what guides their choice and what guides their choice is what's in the public's best interest. And I think we have very clearly shown the, the problems that, that these pens bring about and that the public has just been so supportive on it. Uh, tens of thousands of people have written in. And so the more public support we can give to Hillary this is uh, Hillary Franz, who is the director of DNR. The more people that support our petition, the easier it is and the more difficult it is for Cook to challenge and say, no, we have the right. Um, it's, 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 a public's, it's, it's the public's voice. It's the public's will. It's a social movement. And um, the, more of us that, the more of us that come along, the more impossible it's going to be for this for this industry to stay. And on the other hand, you can also look at it as helping this industry. They need to move to more sustainable management. It is good business as, as Patagonia does. They are truly sustainable in everything that they offer. And the public has faith in what they do. The public does not have faith in what the net pen industry does, and they need to restore public's opinion by actually doing the right thing, going on to land, have closed containment, you know, do not harm the environment from what they're, from their actions. Um, so it can be a very good, it can be a very good thing and encourage them to, um, to make the business move they need to make. And at the same time, making Puget Sound a whole lot better and uh, show the public that your vote basically counts. It can count here and it can count. Uh, it, it, if we all get together and we all want something, we can make a difference and let's do it. It's, uh, it's within our grasp. So, so in purely because we're all 
we're all political now these days based on where we are in the election cycle and all that. Um, uh, I think just the political side of this is that the commissioner of public lands, Hillary France, who will make this decision is an elected position. Absolutely, and, yeah. Um, in order for her to make the decision to restore, to lease these to Wild Fish Conservancy for restoration rather than continuing the net pen operations, uh, she needs to know that she has the support of the people. And so this petition is a way of all of us, whether we're residents of Washington or other states or other countries, wherever you're watching this, for her to know that there is a groundswell of public support for her to do the right thing because she's gonna be running for election um, will help her, uh, help guide her make, I, I believe that she wants to make this decision, but it'll help yeah. an elected official um, to have that kind of support. So. Um, okay, so there's a couple ways we can do this. I think um, this is a, an easy way for everybody to participate in activism. Um, you can hit the take action button that YouTube provides for us here, um, or alternately you can text PROTECT to 40649. That's PROTECT to 40649, and either of those will get you to the petition, and um, all you need to do is sign it or e-sign it, uh, and we really need to blow this out to make this happen. And, and I think we can do it. Um, so we're gonna wrap this up. I just wanna thank all of our guests for joining us. Um, it's really a treat to be online. I wish we were all in person, but um, you know, maybe someday we can actually do these as live events and not be squinting into our computers. Um, also wanna thank everybody that's joining us to watch and is gonna participate in this activism. I think it's, uh, you know, it's really amazing that we're able to do this at all. So in closing, I have, uh, I made a note here. I have three things to ask of you if you're watching this. One is of course, sign the petition. Uh, the second one is on a larger scale to register to vote. There are, I believe at least in Washington, there's five more days from when you see us to, that you can register. Um, and then finally vote in November, like your life depends on it because it does. So um, <laughs> those are my three things. And uh, thank you guys so much. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be doing more of these. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I would, like to, I would like to thank Patagonia for all their efforts to help us. And Ben, thank you so much for everything you do. You guys, are, you guys are volunteering to help us make Puget Sound a better place to live. And I, I can't thank you enough. Um, so wait, wait, really. we're, and we're not getting paid for this? <laughs> well, and Kurt, Kurt, I must say, you know, as you say, these are your words, science is the compass, right? Yes. Yep. We need to drive with that. And, and, and so that's what this is all about. And, and thank you, everybody, for participating in this. We are really stoked to have you here. And, uh, and I think the next one will be live from Puget Sound without next, net pens. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a celebration. Yeah. yeah. Here, here. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.